mammoths, mastodons, and five-ton giant ground sloths. We're all part of a rich diversity of Pleistocene megafauna, and these herbivorous monsters became the foundation for an unprecedented predator diversity, unlike anything we see in modern times. Among these predators were intricately tuned killers, animals with thick bones, powerful forelimbs, and complex hunting strategies, and of course, the most infamous killing apparatus in the history of mammalian predators, a big old pair of saber teeth. In this video, we're gonna look at an animal larger than any cat species around today, with the strength of a bear, the stealth of a jaguar, and the cunning of a whole pride of lions. We'll talk about where they came from, how they dominated the Pleistocene landscape for so many millions of years, and why, all of a sudden, they vanished. But first, we're gonna explain how their discovery changed our world forever. The story of Smilodon overlaps with our own twice. Not just in prehistory, but again, around 190 years ago, 10,000 years after their extinction, when a little-known aspiring doctor left Denmark for Brazil. Smilodon is still one of the most famous discoveries of any extinct predator since the dinosaurs. And this, from the public's perspective at least, is because of just how cool they were. And don't worry, we're going to definitely cover that. But there's a lot more to go into first about why this discovery was so historically relevant and important to science. Everyone watching this video should be familiar with Darwin and his world-changing discoveries. But there's a far lesser known 19th century naturalist who deserves a lot more credit than he receives. And his name was Peter Wilhelm Lund. Lund was born in 1801 in Copenhagen. And it was a time and a place that was marked by tremendous levels of tuberculosis. This condition emerged in the 1600s and it was peaking around the time Lund was born. Not long after, it would reach epidemic proportions and become responsible for up to 25% of deaths on the continent. It was tuberculosis that killed Peter Lund's father and two of his brothers. And it was tuberculosis that inspired him to abandon his plans of becoming a doctor and move to a climate that was less suitable for the disease. He set off to Brazil to get his hands dirty with archeology span and paleontology. And it's no exaggeration to say that this would end up changing the world forever. At the time, while it was known that extinct monsters once roamed the earth, nobody discovered that there were once humans who lived amongst them. More significantly, the biblical date of the earth's origin, or at least human origin, was still strongly believed by many to have been October the 23rd, 4004 BC, specifically at 9.30 in the morning. So when Lund discovered a cave full of ancient beasts and the remains of ancient humans alongside them, it would have been absolutely shattering to this dogma and no doubt a personal crisis to the researcher himself. He concluded that the American continent was significantly older than we had known, and that there would have to be, in his words, a complete inversion to the established understanding of the chronology of life on Earth. His discoveries were published in 1845. That was nine years before Darwin's On the Origin of Species, and they would play a key role in forming Darwin's perspective it's hard to overstate what a significant discovery this was. At the time, such a concept was as unthinkable as finding human remains on Mars. But the evidence was undeniable. Upon publishing this radical discovery, Lund dropped out of fossil hunting altogether, citing a lack of funds. But perhaps this was a reflection of the impact his work had on shattering his own worldview. Darwin, to the contrary, leapt upon these new discoveries with enthusiasm, and he cites Lund and Lund's research partner Clausen in The Origin of Species. So we have Lund to thank for so much of what we know about Earth's recent prehistory. And among many others, the monster that Lund discovered in those caves in Brazil all that time ago was Smilodon populator, one of three species of saber-toothed tiger that would be discovered in subsequent years. Before we describe them, let's try and understand where the genus sits in the cat family tree. Carnivora is an order of mammals that contains most of the large terrestrial predators and a lot of the smaller ones as well. Bears, dogs, cats, seals, and mustelids. These are all examples of some of the families that are found in this order. The cats we know today are members of the suborder Feliformia, which also contains other animals that are cat-like, like civets and fossas, and the name means cat-shaped. And since cats are the most cat-shaped of all, they're in here too. Felidae is the family that we give to the true cats, and there are only two subfamilies left. Those are Felinae and Pantheranae, and these represent the small and big cats, respectively. But there are at least 12 other extinct families described, and the one we're after here today is Machiarodontinae, 
The name means big toothed, and it is entirely fitting since the subfamily contained all the cats with the most enormous canines. But these weren't ancestors of either subfamily of modern cats. In fact, both Philinae and Pantherinae are closer related to one another than either is to Macurodontinae. This was an evolutionary experiment that took a very exciting turn, and while it worked out for a while, it would sadly lead to a dead end, as all the members of this subfamily would be extinct by around 8 to 10,000 years ago. While they were alive, though, the big toothed cats were truly intimidating beasts, growing to much larger than any lion or tiger around today. The subfamily also contained not just the Smilodon genus, but Homotherium, Magantherium, and Dinophelis, some of whom we've talked about in previous videos. But Smilodon is still the most well known. The earliest species was Smilodon gracilis, and this would have diverged from its closest relatives like Megantherium around 2.5 million years ago. But its relationship to the ancestors of modern cats goes way back, and ancestors of Smilodon probably diverged from the ancestors of our cats at least 20 million years ago. To put this in perspective, tigers and house cats have a common ancestor around 10 or 11 million years ago. So Smilodon gracilis, the earliest Smilodon species, is twice as distant from any extant cat as a lion and an ocelot might be from one another. And it was probably this species that evolved into the other two species of Smilodon known. Gracilis was the smallest of the saber-tooths, but it was still pretty big by modern standards. This species may have reached up to around 100 kilograms, about the same weight as a modern puma, and it was roughly the size of a jaguar. And during its reign, from around 2.5 million years to around half a million years ago, it spread all the way from northern North America to northern South America. This was a very successful pioneer species, and having survived competition from the much larger Homotherium, by the time of its extinction it had sired at least one other branch of saber-toothed cat called Smilodon fatalis. Fatalis evolved to take even better advantage of the wealth of giant herbivores that roamed the plains. And as the successor to Grisalis, from around 1.6 million years ago, it took over the role of apex predator in North America, growing to much larger sizes. This species reached upward of around 280 kilograms, and like its ancestor, it sported huge canines and a robust skeleton, only almost three times as massive. Smilodon fatalis is represented to an incredible degree, and if you hear species names like Smilodon mercerii, Floridanus, or Californicus, these are all unofficial species names for fatalis. While it looked a little bit like a lion, it had the thick bones and brute force most commonly associated with bears. And Fatalis, as intimidating as it was, wasn't even close to the largest of the three. Around a million years ago, another branch of Grisalis entered South America, and these ones became geographically or at least genetically isolated for long enough that they emerged as their own species. This was Smilodon Populator. Populator was one of the largest cats to ever roam the Earth. But what does that mean? Let's set a reference point. Lions and tigers, the two largest cat species around today, are from totally different continents, but they're closely related enough that they can sometimes produce offspring, if they're appropriately encouraged to by perverted zookeepers. These offspring aren't healthy by any conceivable metrics, but that's a topic for another video. What is outstanding about them is their size. Male lions have an upregulated gene for rapid growth in their offspring, and this is counted normally by a down-regulating gene in the female. Tigers don't have these genes, so when a male tiger mates with a female lion, the result, a tigron, is much smaller than its parents. But when a male lion mates with a female tiger, the absence of the growth suppression in the tiger allows the lion's upregulated growth genes to plow through unchecked, and this produces offspring that are larger than both of the parents. The resulting abomination is known as a liger, and it is the largest cat in the world. Hercules, the largest known liger is, unsurprisingly, an American production, and he lives in South Carolina. He's about 400 kilos in weight and about 3.5 meters long. This cat stands 1.3 meters at the shoulder, or 0.88 Danny DeVitos. That's not much for an actor, but it's a hell of a lot for a cat. And yet, the larger of the Smilodon populator fossils suggest an animal of around the same height, but 8% heavier than Hercules, no doubt leaner and more muscular too. This cat would have been substantially stronger than any crowd-pleasing crossbreed that we could come up with, let alone any wild cat. It would have had a thicker, denser skeleton, shorter rear limbs, and of course the trademark tusks that made this genus so frightening. 
All Smilodon species had characteristics like this that made them extremely potent predators, yet so many of these adaptations no longer exist in their modern counterparts. Let's take a look at some of them and see if we can figure out why. But before we do, please take a moment to like this video if you're having a good time and hit the subscribe button so that we can send you more. So we mentioned the fixed skeleton, but Smilodon is known for being quite lopsided. This was a predator that used tremendous amounts of strength in its hunting strategy, and this is indicated by the huge forelimbs in relation to the back end. Now the back end was still robust, but it was a lot shorter in limb length. Smilodon had paws that were three times the size of those belonging to a Bengal tiger, and like all members of its genus, it had a back that was not parallel to the ground like in modern cats, but it sloped downwards with longer forelimbs, stockier hind limbs, and a short tail. But Smilodon's infamous teeth were terrifyingly large. In the largest fossils, they are around 28 centimeters long. This is longer than any teeth found from a T-Rex, and researchers estimate that they would grow in at twice the speed of human fingernails. But they didn't come in all at once. Cubs had smaller fangs, and these actually acted to shield the adult teeth as they grew in behind them. It's thought that Smilodon cubs would not get their big boy or girl teeth until they were at least three years old. Once they were in, they required a mouth that could open incredibly wide, and so Smilodon fatalis had a gape that was almost twice that of modern cats. So what does this all tell us about how they lived? The thick skeleton, stocky body, and short tail, these all suggest a predator that is designed for bursts of speed. These were not long-distance runners. They had short, powerful limbs for ambushing and for holding and dragging down powerful animals to the ground. The wide gape also implied a large target, and the incredible yet brittle canines wouldn't have been much use on bone, but they could have been very good for puncturing and bleeding a large animal to death quickly. The choice of large prey suggests a social hunter, as does the large period of parental care. This animal was perhaps a member of extended family structures. Lots of fossils, at least with Fatalis, indicate injuries that have healed, injuries that may have been too much for a solitary predator to survive. And this too suggests that they weren't only reliant on themselves for food. All in all, these were very finely tuned specialists. So why did such a perfect being go extinct? Grossavus disappears from the fossil record around 500,000 years ago, but it's thought this is simply because it evolved into the two later species. But both Smilodon populator and Smilodon fatalis held out until the end of the Pleistocene, and this was a period of great change both in climate and biodiversity. Countless groups of animals went extinct around this time, including mammoths, mastodons, ground sloths, and giant beavers, and pretty much everything that Smilodon would have relied upon for food. These were animals that were highly specialized to hunt very large animals. And this, of course, served the genus so well until those large animals disappeared. And then all of a sudden, its unique adaptations would have become hindrances. Unable to adapt to smaller, faster prey, its extinction was inevitable. And while the specific causes of these mass extinctions, especially of the large herbivores, are still up for debate, their disappearance would no doubt have resulted in the death of the Smilodon genus. As for Lund, who we can thank for bringing us into this world, he settled in Brazil. He realized his early dream of becoming a doctor, and while he may never have overtly accepted the Darwinian theories that he inspired, his legacy paved the way for our current understanding of the giant Pleistocene megafauna and the humans that shared their lives with them. He died at the fine old age of 78 on May 25th, 1880. And when he died, the entire town of Lagoa Santa, where Lund had decided to spend the last decades of his life offering medical services, came out to send him off. The caves where he'd made his discoveries are now protected by almost 5,000 acres of national park, and a huge proportion of his 20,000 fossil discoveries can still be viewed at the Natural History Museum in Copenhagen. And he is the reason why to this day, the saber-toothed tiger that made the Pleistocene megafauna tremble can still live on in our memory. That's all for today. Thank you so much for watching.